When Moses awakened, what did he say? He said, Rabbi inni zalamtu nafsi faqbari. I have been unjust to myself. Forgive me. There's an author, I, remem- I, I memorized that the sentence because it was beautiful. He was discussing the idea of spiritual awakening. And he said, the assumption of 100% moral responsibility is the beginning of spiritual awakening. The assumption of 100% moral responsibility is the beginning of spiritual awareness. This is why when Adam and Eve stepped out of, were, or were kicked out of heaven because they listened to Shaitan, they didn't blame Shaitan. They didn't blame Satan. They didn't say, oh, he whispered to us and we were like, yeah, very innocent. And because we always blame outside forces to actually claim innocence. But this, the fact is everything around us is innocent, including shaitan. Because even in, in, in the Quran we are told shaitan in the Qalamma Qudhi al-Amru qala ma kana li alaykum min sultan illa an da'awtukum fa istajabtum li fala talumun wal mumun anfusakum and the end he even says inni akhaf Allah harab al-alami Shaitan, when, think, when the matter is over, we are told in the Quran, this happens in dunya, after everywhere. It means like, it's, it's a certain condition. When the matter is over, Shaitan says, I have no authority over you whatsoever. Man kana li alaykum min sultan. I have no authority over you whatsoever, except that I called upon you, and you responded. Active. You responded. Don't blame me. Blame yourself. And then at the end he says, I fear God. So okay. even at the end, even Satan is in every even Satan is in. And that is the, the awakening of Adam and the story of Adam and Eve in the Quran. Again, it's it's, it's a beautiful compressed spiritual genetic code of our human condition. Because it compresses the possibility. They wrong. They listen to Satan. They wrong themselves. They kick themselves out of heaven, and yet they also have a spiritual awakening. They didn't blame Satan. They said, "Rabbana dhalamna and fusana, wa illa taqfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunna min al-kafir." God, we have been unjust to ourselves. Again, the I here is taking responsibility. We have been unjust to ourselves. They didn't say, "Oh, Satan came and whispered to us," or in the biblical version, the snake. They, and yet Satan in the story when God said why didn't you bow to me he used to excuse it he said you made me do it he blamed God and he also said why should I bow to this inferior creature from what it was Abba was takbara wa kana min al he disobeyed he acted dominant bigger than himself again the idea of so that game we know that. It's not us. That game is a sickness we fall into, whether from here or here. And when we try to change it, without changing our consciousness, we end up just flipping the role. Mm. Castro was actually a revolutionary rebel. All these like uh, tyrants in the world, a lot of them, most of them, were revolutionary rebels. They go into power, they're just shifting roles. The Prophet wanted us to step out of that by changing our consciousness. When you change your consciousness, when you come out of that victimization, no matter what you do, is successful. When you are a victim, no matter what you do, is a failure and causes much more destruction, as we're seeing everywhere around us. Now, we are victimized in the Middle East, but we're also waiting for saviors. We want, oh, the, we want everybody to reform in the world. We want Israel to become a just nation. We want the UN to reform. We want the United States to become a merciful nation to spread democracy. We want everybody to become good. And we never talk about that we have been unjust to ourselves. God forgive us. If we don't, if we don't awaken, we will be among the losers. Thank you. Thank you.
ta'inu, which is an active verb, says sustain or, or empower yourselves with God. Ta'inu, it comes from help. Help yourselves with God. So it's all active verbs. And they're saying, Uvina, which is a passive verb, we have been harmed. So you see the victim, the victim's language is always passive. Things are always happening to them. They're not happening to anything. And Moses is trying to change their consciousness, to bring them to the idea of that you do things. You realign yourself to God. You center yourself in God and you actively practice patience. Many people think patience is being a victim and not saying anything. And that's very different. When the Quran says be patient, it's an active mm. verb, an active state of mind. Mm. When somebody hits me, and I'm like feeling, oh, they hurt me, but I will not do anything because I can't do anything, that's not patience. That's submission. But when somebody <coughs> hits me and I can hit back, I don't do it because I know that I'm violating something. That's taqwa. And taqwa and sabr in, in the Quran are always together. So I practice sabr to align myself to God. That's something active. So they're hard. But it can be misconstrued. And that's what I'm saying. It's very dangerous. There's a fine line. Yes. Because many people say, we were patient under Saddam, we were patient under Assad, we were patient for so many years, now we need to do something. So, but submission, a state of submission, which is which, which what they're saying, because when he said, this is why it's fascinating, this passage, when he said, be patient, they said, we have been, this is what they think they're saying, yes. we have been patient, but what they were saying, that the reason the Quran changed the wording, he said, we, they said, we have been harmed, that we have been harmed before you came, and after you came, which means like they're accusing him that you didn't save us, but as we're saying, victims, are in a passive state, things happen to them. And therefore, they also want to be saved. So even when they think of salvation, they don't think of awakening to their own active role. They think, oh, I want a hero to come and save me. But that doesn't change the situation of passivity because I've been harmed and now I'm saved. Oh, somebody saved me. Somebody harmed me, somebody saved me. We want a savior to come and save us. So what, what is the answer of Moses here? Very short but very profound. So when they say we have been harmed before you and after you, he says, قَالَ عَسَى رَبُّكُمْ أَنْ يُخْلِكَ عَدُوَّكُمْ وَيَسْتَخْلِفَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرْ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ He says, may, may your Lord destroy your enemy, the enemy that you perceive in Pharaoh, and make you the inheritor of the land and see what you shall do. And may God see what you shall do. So he, look what he, his answer is. He made them, he says, like, you are oppressed, you are harmed, you have an enemy. That's already a whole paradigm. He says, if God destroyed your enemy and placed you in the place of their enemy, God will watch what you will be doing. Mm -hmm. hmm. And why this is so profound? Because it connects to all this idea of the impossibility of oppression. When we enter this false game of oppressor and oppressed, what happens when the oppressed want to save themselves in, without awakening to their role in the victimization? What happens is that they want to destroy the enemy, right? And they are wrong, so what happens? They become tired. When victims strike out, what happens? What happens is that they don't step out of the skin, oppressed, oppressed. They switch roles. They switch roles. They become the tyrant. And that's what Moses is challenging them. He says, if God destroyed your enemy now, and why Moses is saying that? Because there's no oppressor without oppressed. There's no oppressed without oppressor. And if, God, if you have, you don't step from this game and God destroys your enemy, what's going to happen? Because you're caught up in this duality. Then you're going and, to... And this explains what has been happening in human history. Even when there's a, a strong revolution against injustice, we find the new revolutionaries 
there, really stepping back because their consciousness has not changed. Now we come to, to a concept in the Quran which is so part of this. Once we understand this, we start the Quran slowly start becoming clearer and interconnected to us. Why the Quran does not allow the oppressed to defend themselves? This is very hard for Muslims to read in the Quran and they don't want to look at the verse. <coughs> When, when, when the followers of the Prophet in Mecca, when Bilal was under the rock, when people were being tortured and killed, always the Prophet would pass by them and he would say, Sabran ala Yasir, fa'inna mu'idakum jannah. Be patient, the people, the family of Yasir. Tumayya, the first martyr in Islam was a black woman, a woman, and black. Because that woman, even though she was tortured, she had gained, regained her humanity. Bilal, he was saying, Ahad and Ahad. Something awakened in him. He was freer than all the people who were torturing him. They were trying to don't, to keep using resources. And think of the person torturing, how much physical energy and sustaining, and, and Abu Jahl had to hire people to even do the torture and pay them money to, to maintain this domination. Yet the Prophet would pass, did, did he say to Bilal, defend yourself, Bilal, have some dignity? No. This is what we miss as Muslims. We don't understand why the Prophet during the time of Mecca did not defend himself. Not only that, the self-defense also is in, not in the Quran. The time that defense is mentioned in the Quran, Inna Allah ladina amanu. That God defends the people who have faith. And yet, this is one of our idols in the world. Self-defense. And even when people want to want to defend Islam, defense. They say, Islam is a peaceful religion, except for self-defense. <laughs> no. And yet, Islam sometimes in the Quran, it acts for aggression, even for people who are not harm you. It says, مَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ الْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الْرِجَالِ وَنِسَاءِ وَالْمِزَانِ Why don't you fight in the cause of those who have been harmed or oppressed in the land? Or weakened, literally, that's the idea, weakened, of men and women and children who are caught up in an unjust town who are asking God, please save us from this unjust town. Rabbana, akhrijna min hadihi qariyati zalimi ahluwa. Take us out of this, this town or this nation whose people have become unjust to us. That's a different kind of action because it comes from an action of moral responsibility, not from a state of victimization. So we have to understand that. When we are caught up in that sickly game, the Quran is telling us, don't raise your hands. Kufu aidiyakum wa salat. Suspend your hands and perform prayer. Why? Literally means stop defending yourself and raise your consciousness. And when we look at Sira, we see the compatibility of that. The Prophet during the time of Mecca, 13 years, they didn't do anything. Anything. It's the only state, the state of Medina was established in human history where nobody was killed on the other side. How many people died on the side of Quraysh during that revolution, the Mecca revolution? None. None. No one. Because he declared amnesty. Because the Prophet declared amnesty when he conquered. No, I'm saying before, during the time, his revelation before he arrived in, in, in Medina. And even when the Medina people came and they did the Aqaba al-Ula, al aqaba al the Treaty of Aqaba, the first Treaty of Aqaba, the first, the second Treaty of Aqaba, and then there was the Medina Charter. When the Medina people asked him, should we fight the people of Mecca? He said, we're not allowed. Lam nu'mar ba'd. We're not allowed yet. Young men would come to the Prophet Muhammad, for example, Abdul Rahman bin Awf. They would ask him, we were dignified people because you know they were they had the ideas of revenge, <laughs> chivalry, and they said we have been humiliated people with you. And he would say, Umirna bil we have been asked to forget. So during the time where people felt victimized and weak in Mecca, they were asked to practice patience. After Medina was established, then there were wars, but they happened in a state of moral responsibility. It's a very different state. And in our world today, the means also have changed. The prophets rode camels and horses. 
Now we have other means of transportation. Now we also are in a stage of humanity that we can resolve our conflict much more economically. The Quran is showing us that tyranny is wasteful for both sides. That's why the, the, the concept of musrifin is very, very much repeated in the Quran. Because tyranny, this strong connection between people, waste resources. The more we align to equality, the more we step out of victimizer and victimized, the more we save resources. So when we understand this, we start to understand that, we start to realize that all that happens in the world is not done by God the way we perceive it and we blame God for it. Oh, and why are you doing this to us, God? We tend to do that. And that's why we have to always do astaghfirullah, even for things we don't know, because we're constantly misconstruing and our miseries as if they are tested by God. Uh, he asked me to uh, to discuss the malaise of the Middle East and why there is such deep trouble. I cannot please yes. Yeah. So I said, uh, why don't we discuss the issue of injustice and oppression in the Quran? And because it's a huge topic, I chose a specific passage from the Quran that, in my view, captures this conversation. Um, because it is a conversation. It is a conversation between Moses, Pharaoh, and his people. So you have three main characters. You have Pharaoh, the oppressor. You have the oppressed, the people. And then you have Moses. And the, re the importance of the three elements here is that in the Quran, we are told that humanity is split between those who dominate the land and and the weak, those who are who have been weakened, al fil ardi, which is a very interesting expression in the Quran. The Quran does not use the word oppressed, mazlum. It uses oppressors. And what is the counterpart of oppressors in the Quran? It's self oppressed. And, and the significance of this is that Mazlum in Arabic is ala wazin mas'ul. It is a passive state. So it's a state of oppression where you have been oppressed by somebody else, where you have lost your agency. You don't have anything, any doing in that. So somebody is oppressing you, they are doing the action, and you're lacking action and agency. And so what happens is that one side has agency, the other side doesn't have agency. And you notice how in language, in, in all human languages, we tend to use that. Zalim Muslim in Arabic we say. Oppressed, oppressed. The Quran doesn't use that. The Quran uses oppressed and those who oppress themselves. So the Quran uses Zalimi and Fatim. So it gives back agency to both sides. So both sides are participating. Because when we say zalim and mazlum, we say fa'il mas'ul. One side is doing action, the other side lacking action. So the Quran is showing us that, no, in order to create the dance and the dynamic of oppression, you need the participation and cooperation of two sides. One side is oppressing, the other side participates in their, in their oppression. There have been philosophers who have actually dealt with this. One of them was Hegel, and you may have come across the famous, the famous, uh, the German philosopher Hegel, who had uh, a concept called the master-slave dialectic, in which he says the master cannot exist without the slave, because if you don't have a slave, who are you? So the master's identity is defined through the presence and the acceptance of the slave. There have been, of course, in modern times, a lot of psychologists and philosophers who really try to understand the idea of oppression or the dynamic of oppression, why it takes place. And only very recently they started discussing the idea of oppressed as participatory and active in oppression and how 
some ideas develop in childhood where, for example, if somebody has very aggressive parents, the child, for example, relinquish their subjectivity in order to get approval of the parent. Or sometimes the child is a brat and they overpower their parents, so they also think that no other subjectivity exists. It's a relationship where one subjectivity exists. The other relinquishes their subjectivity, their active role. So it becomes almost an imitation of a God's relationship, right? And, um, and we call that omnipotence. Total control, total power over everything. And that is a human tendency. And the Quran discusses this in the very first revelation that the Prophet received. This is the first malaise in the human psyche that humanity, a human being, has the propensity to over control. Yatra in Arabic, taqa means really tyranny and to control, complete control. So, this love for omnipotence is inside human beings. We want to act like God that we have control and power over everything. However, human life requires the presence always of, a, of an other, of an other faith, an other person. And this is why the message of Islam that the Prophet chose to send to all the nations around him when he wrote his first messages to invite people, he chose the verse, Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawat, come to a word of equality which is, and it says, where we do not take each other as gods above each other. It's explaining exactly the problem. This is really the invitation of Islam. That when we come in interaction with other people, other nations, we invite them to a relationship of equality. Not only that, but it, that the end of the verse, it says, فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا that even if the other side doesn't accept that equation, we say so the, number that of, so the number of this verse is? It's in Surah An-Nisa. I think it's 162. Yeah, Surah An-Nisa. This is a very central uh, uh, verse in the Quran. Ta'alu ila kalimatin sawa. Come. Come to a word uh, of equality. This is the invitation of Islam. And this is on all levels. Between nations, between man and woman, and even between parents and child. Because although we have more information than the child, when we treat the child as an equivalent human being with an equal soul, our interaction becomes different. So the Quran is healing this malaise in humanity, where people fall out of this mutuality of mutual recognition where I look at my, my friend Samara here, and I, and I feel that I am a person, and she is a person. I don't want to overpower her, and I don't feel inferior to her. It's a relationship that is so, when you think about it, it's so beautiful and natural, but it is the most that it makes us. Because when people encounter each other, one side wants to take over, the other side either wants to take over again, Okay, so now, when we understand this, we will understand the message of all the prophets. They came and they saw this imbalance in society. They saw this, they saw this imbalance between societies, inside societies, between families, between couples, children, parents, friends, everywhere. And then they, they ask people, both sides, the weak, and the power of Moses. They said, you can come out of that. <laughs> and the reason I chose Moses is because in the Quran, Moses is a central archetypal figure in breaking this domination imagination, the imagination of tyranny. And who is the symbolic representation of domination in the Quran? Who is the one who says, Ana Rabbukum al A'la, I am your yeah. Lord, Pharaoh? The Yeah, Pharaoh. Yeah. So then we have to understand as the 
Jalaluddin, Mawlana Jalaluddin, whom he says that Moses and Pharaoh and the people, all of them are you. They're all inside of you, inside your consciousness. Because sometimes we are, we are Pharaoh with our children. Sometimes we are Pharaoh with our families. And sometimes we are, oh, the oppressed. And how many times are we Moses when we step out of both that dynamic? So the message of the Prophet, now we start to understand, is a message of healing. To heal the malaise of humanity that has <coughs> been living this for thousands of years. Where people, when they come together, they don't come as equals. 